For this video, we're going to talk about another theorem that helps us evaluate limits of functions. This is a theorem that is not explicitly stated in your textbook, but they use quite a bit in the homework problems from section 2.2 and beyond. So here's the theorem as you would see it if you looked at another textbook and tried to understand what this theorem is about. So we're going to talk about just a couple things about it and then we'll do some examples. So the first thing it says is that I have a function f of x and g of x that are equal. So what that means is that they would have the same outputs for all x's in some open interval containing x equals c. So what that means is for all x's that are around x equals c, except possibly at x equals c itself. All right, and then the second part of the if part of this theorem says if the limit as x approaches c of g of x exists, so that would be a limit that we know or we can figure out using some other means. And then it says for the conclusion of the theorem, then the limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to the limit as x approaches c of g of x. So one important thing here is that this theorem says these two limits are equal. It doesn't mean the functions are equal. Um, in fact, if they're not the same at x equals c, then they're not exactly the same function, but the limits are equal. And since we're working on limit problems, that's usually what we're interested in. So let's look at an example to do with this. Okay, so we're going to look at this example that I put here. Um, so we're interested in finding the limit as x approaches 3 of this rational function x squared minus 9 over x minus 3. So I do have some substitution shortcut theorems for limits of rational functions, but unfortunately that theorem doesn't apply here. I really can't substitute x equals 3 because that would give me 0 in the denominator of the fraction. So that doesn't necessarily mean that the limit doesn't exist. It just means I can't use a substitution shortcut theorem to evaluate that limit. But instead, I can use the theorem that we're talking about now, functions that agree at all but one point. You might notice that for this rational function, if I do a little bit of algebra, I can rewrite this function in a slightly different form. So I'm going to be very careful about the way I write this out. I want you to notice I wrote equals and I'm writing that limit notation. I'm not evaluating the limit yet, I'm just doing algebra on the function. So it's important that I keep that limit notation uh, as part of the problem until I actually do the step where I evaluate the limit. All right, so the numerator is a difference of squares. You can factor that into S x plus 3 times x minus 3. And then you might notice that there are these common factors of x minus 3 in the numerator and denominator. And so we can cancel those factors out. I'm going to kind of just do a little dashed line here because I want to kind of come back and talk about that. And we're going to say that that is equal to the limit as x approaches 3 of just what's left, just the x plus 3. Okay, and then we can finish the limit pretty easily from there, but I want to emphasize a couple things about this function and uh, why this theorem is what's applying to this function. If you look at the original function that we started with, and you look at this function that we have right now, they are not the same function because they don't have the same domain. The first function has a domain uh, that includes everything except 3, and the function that I have now at the end of my work uh, is a function that has a domain of all real numbers. So they are not the same function. However, they are the same everywhere except that one place in the domain that's not included in the domain of the first function at x equals 3. And remember that a limit is asking us about what happens around a point, not at a point. So I don't care if they're the same at a particular point. All right, so these two functions that I put a pink box around are functions that agree at all but one point. And fortunately, this function that we have at the end is a nice polynomial function, and so we have a substitution shortcut theorem that says for polynomial functions, we can evaluate that limit by just thinking about what the function does at the point. Remember, that's not really what limits are about. 
but sometimes we can use that convenient shortcut for really nice or we call them well-behaved functions. All right, we're going to look at another example here. So I'm just going to scroll this up a little bit and we'll look at another example. So again, we have a rational function. I might think about whether I could use a substitution shortcut theorem for rational functions, but unfortunately you're going to notice that if you try to substitute in x equals zero in the denominator of the fraction you get zero and so that doesn't work. That doesn't mean the limit doesn't exist, it means I just can't use substitution to get that limit. However, I can do some of the same things I just did for the last problem where I do some algebra simplifications and hopefully we get some nice simplifications so that we end up with an easier limit to deal with. Okay, so for this one I might notice there's a common factor of x in the numerator and if I factor that out I'm left with 5x cubed plus 3. In the denominator I also have a common factor of x so I can factor that out and I'm left with 9x plus 7. Uh, hopefully your algebra skills are refreshed enough to remember that you shouldn't be canceling things in rational functions unless they are factors, common factors of the numerator and denominator. So I do have some common factors here. All right, at the instant I crossed those x's out, I actually changed it to a new function with a different domain. x equals zero was not in the domain of the first function x equals zero now is in the domain of what I have left after I canceled out those x's. All right, and so these are again functions that agree at all but one point. Uh, these are rational functions and so we have a theorem, a substitution shortcut theorem for rational functions provided the denominator is not zero when you do that substitution. So I can go ahead and put in zero. and it looks like I get three sevenths for my limit. Okay, a couple other things I want to emphasize about my notation in both this example and the previous example. You're going to notice that we start with a limit at the beginning of the problem and I keep writing those symbols LIM in front while I'm doing the algebra. It's actually incorrect if you don't write those there and I will be picky about that by the time we get to the exam. So I'll hopefully give you enough feedback by then that you'll know if you're doing okay or not. But you notice that by the end here, after I'm ready to use that substitution shortcut theorem, I'm not writing limit anymore because at that step I'm evaluating the limit. So if you're doing any preliminary work while you're just doing algebra or rearranging things, make sure that you write that little LIM in front of the problem. Okay, we have one more example here and this has some important algebra in it that you might not have ever seen before, so it's important to look at this last one. All right, so for this example uh, I have what looks kind of like the other two problems I did except I have this radical in here and so the algebra is a little trickier uh, with the radical in here. I might start again by thinking about if I could use a substitution shortcut theorem but instantly you should recognize you cannot substitute in x equals zero because that would make the denominator zero. So there is a little bit of algebra that you can do here which you may not have ever done before or if you did do it it might have been a long time ago in algebra and you might not have thought about using it in exactly this way before. We're going to do what's called rationalize the numerator and you might have done rationalizing the denominator before uh, you can actually rationalize any part of a fraction, uh, but in this case the radical that's in the problem is in the numerator. So we're going to rationalize the numerator. We might notice that the numerator has two big terms, the radical and then that's all one term and then minus and then two is the second term. And so we're going to use a key fact that uh, what I have here on the numerator is something of the form a minus b, where the a is the entire radical square root of 4 plus 3x and the b is 2. And we're going to use the key idea that if I have something like this of the form a minus b and I multiply it by essentially what looks like the other factor in a difference of squares, a plus b, 
that when I FOIL that out, I get some nice cancellation with some of the terms here. So when I FOIL that out, I get a squared plus ab minus ab minus b squared, and those middle terms cancel. So you get a squared minus b squared. We kind of looked at that difference of squares earlier when we factored, kind of going back the other way. So we're going to use the idea to rationalize the numerator, and we're basically going to want to multiply the numerator by this other factor in a difference of squares. This strategy works also if you start with an a plus b form, and then in that case you would be wanting to multiply by the other factor, so you might be wanting to introduce an a minus b form. Okay, so I erased some all that writing that I had over there so that we have room to work out the problem, uh, but I left the two boxes here just to emphasize that we have the numerator that is of the form a minus b, and so we want to multiply that numerator by an expression of the form a plus b. So my a is a square root of 4 plus 3x, and the b is 2. I want a plus in here so that when I multiply this out, I'll get that nice cancellation on those middle terms. All right, so the other key idea is that I can't just go around multiplying parts of a fraction by things that I would like to do. I have to make sure I keep things balanced so that I don't change the original problem. So essentially what I'm actually going to be doing is multiplying by a form of 1, where I'm multiplying the numerator and the denominator by the same expression, so that it really doesn't change the original expression. All right, so then we're going to go ahead and do that algebra and multiply that out. Remember, I'm just doing algebra. I'm not really evaluating the limit yet, so I'm still going to write that LIM in front. All right, and then on the numerator, uh, I'll have the square root of 4 plus 3x times the square root of 4 plus 3x. So that'll be the square root of something times itself, or I can think about that as the square root of 4 plus 3x, the quantity squared, and the square and the square root will eventually undo each other. You can skip some of these algebra simplifying steps as long as you can do them correctly. That's all right with me. Okay, and then when I do the outer part for FOIL, I'll have 2 times the square root of 4 plus 3x. Uh, that 2 that I'm multiplying by is not in the radical, so I need to make sure when I multiply I keep that outside the radical. And then for the inner part of FOIL, I'll have minus 2 times square root 4 plus 3x. That cancellation on those middle terms is really what I'm after here. And then the L part, I'll have a minus 4. All right, so I got a lot of simplifying that can happen on that numerator. On the denominator, I could also distribute through, but I'm going to leave that in a factored form on the denominator, mainly because I've done a problem like this before, so I know what's going to happen later. So it's okay if you multiply that x out in the denominator, but eventually you're probably going to want to factor it back out anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and leave that. The key part here is what I'm trying to do is deal with the radicals that were in the original problem, so I'm really focusing on simplifying that stuff. Okay, so again, I'm going to write LIM in front still until I'm ready to evaluate that limit. Uh, this first expression that we have here at the beginning, I've got the square root of something squared. So for that, I just end up with 4 plus 3x. I could leave that in parentheses if I want, but I don't have to. And then the plus 2 times square root of 4 plus 3x and the minus 2 times square root 4 minus 3x cancel. And then I have a minus 4 on numerator. All right, and then on the denominator, I'm still going to just leave that in factored form. Be careful also when you write these radicals that the radical it extends over what it should extend over and does not extend over things it should not. Okay, so after I foiled all that stuff out on the numerator and canceled those middle terms, uh, then you might notice there's some other cancellation that's going to happen too. I have a 4 minus 4 on the numerator, so I'm going to rewrite this. Limit x approaches 0 of 3x over x times square root of 4 plus 3x plus 2, that whole quantity. Um, okay, and then on the numerator, uh, all I have left on the numerator is 3 times x. 
So at this point, not previously, but at this point, x is really a factor of the numerator, and I have a common factor out front here of x on the denominator, and so those x's cancel. At the instant I cancel those x's, I actually change the domain of the function, so that is the point where I ended up with functions that agree at all but one point. Uh, before that, x equals zero was not included in the domain, but now if I look at what I have left, x equals zero is included in the domain of this function. All right, so I've done algebra, algebra, algebra. I've been very careful to write LIM, x approach zero, in front of every single step. And now here I am down to a function that uh, includes x equals zero in its domain. I can use a, actually a combination of some substitution shortcut theorems, one about uh, functions involving radicals or powers, some about polynomials and some about quotients, sums. So it's a combination of several substitution shortcut theorems, but at that point I can do substitution shortcut theorem and go ahead and evaluate this limit. So I end up with 3 over square root of 4 plus 3 times 0, that will be 0, plus 2. Notice I'm not writing LIM anymore, I'm evaluating this limit. This is going to give me a number that is the answer for the limit. So that becomes 3 over square root of 4 plus 2, or 3 over 2 plus 2, which is 3 fourths.